Good morning. Take your Bibles, please. We'll have scripture reading. This morning we have just one passage, and it's found in the book of Matthew, chapter 13, 1 through 23. Matthew 13, 1 through 23, and this is entitled, The Parable of the Sower. Excuse me. Starting at verse 1. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered round him that he got into a boat and sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seeds, some fell along the path. And the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still, other seeds fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. He who has ears, let him hear. The disciples came to him and asked, Why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. For I tell you the truth. Many prophets and righteous men longed to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears a message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The one who received the seed that fell on rocky places is the man who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since he has no root, he lasts only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, he quickly falls away. The one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word, but the worries of his life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, make it making it untruth, unfruitful. But the one who received the seed that fell on good soil is the man who hears the word and understands it. He produces a crop, yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. That's our scripture reading. And this is the time for children to be dismissed for Children's Church. Yeah, because I'm not on. How about now? Let's start with prayer. Father, we thank you for a beautiful day, for the sunshine that warms our hearts. Father, we thank you so much for your Son that brings us everlasting, eternal life. Father, I just cannot comprehend how much you love us, but I am so, so thankful that you do. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I thank you for a place place that we can come that's warm and that's safe to worship you, Lord, without fear of being persecuted or anything, Father. You love us so much. And I pray for those that don't have that opportunity today, Father. I pray for them for their safety. I pray that your word reaches those, Father. And for those that are without, that don't have a warm place, Father, that you comfort them and provide for them. And Father, that we'll be the hands and feet that we need to be to help get that job done, Father. Bless this service today. For it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. So this morning's sermon is entitled, Well, there's a lot of reasons for that. One big reason is, well, it was 4 o'clock yesterday afternoon when Debbie texted me and said, you haven't given a sermon title to Diana. I said, well, I don't have one yet. (laughs) Well, I haven't wrote one. So I'm thinking, well, well might just be a good thing to go with today. Because so many times we say that, well, what are you going to do next? 
Well, are you going to do this? Well, are you going to do that? So let's look at Matthew 13, 1 through 23, and look at the parable of the sower. But first, let me tell you a little bit about some fun we had Friday night. Um, David is the only one here. Did you have a good time? Yes. Yes. We got to go, David and Brad couldn't get off work. I'm so sorry. He's, he's so bummed. And uh, Matt and Mitch and Jacob and I went to the um, Winter Jam Tour in Spokane. We got to stand out in this cold weather from four to six standing in line. And Mitch, brave little ignorant soul that he is, <laughs> said that I'll be fine in these shorts. I'm like... No, you won't. But um, Melinda said, he's 18, he can do what he wants. I said, well, I'll make sure before he goes into hypothermia, I'll get him some, something to warm him up. But we had a good time, um, saw some great artists, got to hear to- Tony Nolan speak, if you're familiar with him. It was just a great time that we had. And last week, I challenged you to be like Barnabas. I said that... Look at the character traits of Barnabas. Pick a character trait. Put that into action this week. Some of you may have deliberately done that. Some of you may not have deliberately done that, but still may have done it without even realizing it. We were able to go because Mark and Diana did a Barnabas act. They took over the movie night so that we could go. While I was gone, my wife was home recovering from surgery, and Debbie went and spent the evening with her. So Debbie did an act of Barnabas. And then when I got back, she stayed till 1.30 and took the boys the rest of the way into town so that I wouldn't have to take them into town then. So it would save me 30 minutes, hour, probably hours worth of sleep and everything. So there's acts of kindness and love, acts of Barnabas, acts of service that thank you guys for. And that was able to bring these boys and let them experience the message of God and, and Christian fellowship and everything. It was a great time. So if you did not do an act of Barnabas, I'm going to challenge you again today to be like Barnabas so that we can make a difference. In Matthew 13, verses 1 through 23, it says, That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it, while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. Farmer is Jesus Christ. Farmer is God. The farmer is the one who sows the message, however you want to relate that. And we'll create some points in here. My sermon is not really over this passage as far as let's break down and see who was each type of soil or anything. It's to give us a challenge again to be like Barnabas, to be the one type of soil that we need to be. You can go home and read it more and, and challenge yourself more to understand it. And that's what you should do. You should read to study the Scriptures so that any time you have an opportunity to tell others of Jesus Christ, you have that knowledge in your heart. You have rightly divided the word of truth so that you're ready to talk to others. If you remember from Acts, when Peter got out of prison, he didn't have a pre-wrote sermon, just like I don't have one today. He had in his heart to preach the gospel message of Jesus Christ. He had read and studied Scriptures, and he was empowered by the Holy Spirit to do that work. You don't have to have a pre-wrote out sermon. You have to be obedient to tell others the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And if you let yourself go and you are the vessel, then God will speak through you with the power of His Spirit. You do not have to be a man that goes to seminary and gets this degree or anything else. You just need to be willing. So many times we think that we can't preach to others because we don't have a dynamic testimony either. So many of the guys and girls that... uh, Um, show had dynamic testimonies and so many times Mitch said something to me about that he's like well I know what my testimony is but it's not as dynamic as that you don't have to have a dynamic testimony you don't have to have been saved from the depths of hell literally on this world because you were into drugs and alcohol and about to die and weighed 40 pounds and still living type thing you just need to be obedient to God you have a testimony and thank the Lord that if you did not go through that and are worshiping Him, that you did not have to go through that. We all have testimonies. We all have opportunities to witness for Jesus Christ. Well, a farmer sowed a seed. He was scattering the seed. Some fell along the path. So what is the path? The path is the area outside of the field. If you've ever planted a field for grass or wheat or whatever type of crops, you prepare a certain area of soil. 
The path is the area outside of that where the ground was never cultivated. It's hard. It's rocky. Many paths that we see today are paved so that things will not grow in them. They can't grow. But every once in a while you'll see a little crack where you'll see a little growth coming out or something where that's cracked. The pathway was the hardened area. And what happened? Some fell along the paths and the birds came and ate it up. Well, Luke says also that it was trampled on. And I think that's important to look at too. The seeds were on a hard surface. They could not reach soil. If they can't reach soil, they cannot grow. A crop cannot be produced. So either they were trampled on and destroyed or the birds came and took them away and ate them. Some fell on rocky places where there wasn't much soil. And it's, it sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. Many times when you're cultivating your field and everything, you don't know what's just under that surface. And you go to plant and throw the seeds in there, and those seeds may start to come up. But right underneath it, there's just a fine layer of dirt, and then there's a big, heavy rock. There's no way that the seeds are going to ever be able to take root. Sure, they're going to sprout up if they have moisture. They're going to start to grow, but as soon as the sun comes up, they're going to wither, just like it says here. Where it did not have much soil, it sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. A lot of times we can't see that surface area, but that surface area is our heart. Those believers, those people, have heard the gospel message and they're like, there's something to this. But for whatever reason, because of the Christians they know, because of the troubles in their lives, for whatever reason, they don't ever take root. Their heart is still hard. And there's no root that can take place. And then, after whatever time period, they tend to fall away. Other seeds fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Well, if you're going to plant a field, one of the first things you do besides preparing the soil is you may put in a... uh, What's the word I'm looking for? Not an herbicide. Not a fertilizer. The, the killer. The weed killer. A weed killer. I don't know the word I'm looking for, but when you put in a weed killer to get rid of that, you let the soil then prepare and then you go back to plant it. Because you don't want any weeds whatsoever in that soil. Because what happens? If there's weeds in that soil, boy, they multiply a lot bigger than the crop does. And when they're young and tender, just coming up, just sprouting, you don't know what's a weed or not. You don't know a lot of times if it's the weed or the plant that you're trying to produce. So you want to get rid of the weeds. Well, there's a problem, isn't it? Because so many times we don't get rid of all the weeds in our life. We act like we do. We try to cover them up. But if you don't get them out of the soil to begin with, you're going to have a problem with them coming up later. And what happens? When they fall among the thorns which grew up, they choke the plants. Mark says that they did not bear grain. So not only did they choke the plants, but they choked the plants up enough that what? They weren't effective at producing a crop. So many times when you go, you can't even take hay if you ride horses into Montana without it being inspected. It's got to be weed-free hay and has to be inspected before you can take it in because they don't want the weeds getting into their crops. We don't want any weeds in our crop. But other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. So that was soil that was properly prepared. There were no um, thorns in it. The rocks had been removed. The path had been cultivated. It was good, fertile earth. There was fertilizer in it. And what happened? It produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. He who has ears, let him hear. The disciples came to him and asked, Why do you speak to people in parables? He replied, The knowledge of the secret of the kingdoms of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused, like a rock. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn. And Jesus always has a promise, and I would heal them. But blessed 
are your eyes because they do see, and your ears because they hear. For I tell you the truth, many prophets and righteous men long to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away that what was sown in his heart. This is the seed that falls along the path. If anyone here today does not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, that's what's happened. You've heard the seed and you've rejected it for whatever reason. There is no salvation, so there is condemnation. There is penalty for your sins. And Jesus Christ says, I mean, God says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If you do not know Jesus, you are doomed to spend an eternity apart from God in hell. Hopefully that's not the case of anyone here today. If it is, don't let another day go by. We don't know what we'll have for tomorrow. We don't know that there'll be a tomorrow. There's no better time than now. Jesus said, come, follow me. He didn't say, when you're ready. He said, come and follow me. Verse 20, the one who received the seed that fell on rocky places is the man who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since he has no root... He lasts only a short time. When trouble or persecution, and Luke says testing, comes because of the word, he quickly falls. Well, what happens if you don't have root, if you're not grounded in God's word, if you're not grounded in prayer, if you're not seeking Him? Then you don't have a very deep root. You're not going to produce a fruit at all. You're not going to have any life in you if you don't produce a root. The root is where the structure comes from. But if your root is not strong because it can't reach that good soil because your heart is still hardened, it's still focused on the things of this world. I love you, God, but I am not willing to serve you yet because I've got this career that I've got to take care of. I love you, God, but I'm not ready to give up my home because if I say that I am willing, you might take me to a mission field and I'm just not ready to do that. Jesus said, come and follow me. There were no restrictions. It wasn't an option plan. It was come and follow me. So what happens when there are trials and persecutions? When there are distractions in this world, you get distracted. Satan sees that and he comes plummeting in. And he says, is that what God really said? And you disobey him and you don't follow him. And as a result, you don't bear the kind of fruit that you should bear. Verse 22, the one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it out. Luke says the pleasures of this life, making it unfruitful. So you've got a crop that's producing, but you didn't get the weeds out of your life. You did not take those things and put it at the altar. Those things are still your God. You don't realize it. You say that you're working because you've got to work. Or are you working because you want more toys? Are you working because you don't have faith in Him to provide? Sure, we're scared. But Jesus says, come and follow me. So the fruits that you bear are, are fruits tied in with weeds. Your fruits aren't as effective. They're not as productive as what they could be. In fact, you might not even can sell those fruits. You can't sell them in Montana if they have weeds in the hay. They don't even want it. They don't want your fruits. And there'll be others. I heard a comment when I was... Um, at the concert that I'm a half Christian. Well, what does that mean? How can you be a half Christian? Well, I know who God is. I want to follow God. But I see others that don't follow God wholeheartedly. And I'm confused. Now, that statement was made because of us, me included, because of the things that we do that are not like Christ, that are not like Barnabas, that are inconsistent to that world. They see us talk. They might see some of our actions, some of our fruits, see the good things that we do. But then they see the weeds that are still in our life. And those weeds make our fruit ineffective. Make the crop not what it should be. You have to get rid of the weeds in your life. You have to lay them down before God and have faith. It's not about half-hearted service. We've looked at that plenty of times. It's about whole-hearted service. And God says, I will heal them. I will bring blessings upon them and blessings upon their generations. 
He knows it's not going to be easy. That's why He said, I'm going to go prepare a place and I'm going to send the counselor for you, for you to empower you. We have everything we need. But so many times we're so afraid to let go and let God. And it's not easy. It's a process. And I'm not here to condemn anyone. I'm here just to read the Bible. All I've got is Bible verses in front of me today. The man who hears the, wor- the Word but worries about this life. And I think we all can relate to that. But in verse 23 it says, But the one who received the seed that fell on good soil is the man who hears the Word and what? Understands it. He produces a crop yielding a hundred Sixty or thirty times what was sown. Matthew 19, verses 16 through 22 say this. Now a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? And this is the third time that I've talked about this passage. I know of at least, maybe more. Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied. The young man was educated. He was a churchgoer. He knew the Bible. He studied and prayed. He knew the Scriptures. And he said, Now what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, obey the commands. Which ones? The man inquired. Jesus replied, Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Honor your wife and mother. Love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man said, All of these I have kept. I have done it right. What do I still lack? Anything? And he says, well? And Jesus tells him what the well is. Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus told him what needed to be done. He said, come and follow me, but he knew the man's heart. The man was one of the ones that the soil was sown and there were thorns in his life. He had to get rid of those thorns. And I know that we get scared. I get scared every time when I say, Lord, take all this. Because I'm afraid he's going to take it all, plain and simple. That doesn't mean that he's going to. He might. He might not. It means you need to be willing to give it to him. All of it, not part of it. Not the secrets that you keep back. Not the things that you still hold on to before the comfort and security. Because if you're not willing to give those things to Him, then they're still your God. They still mean more to you than He does. And then He said, then come and follow Me. So Jesus said, well, what are you going to do? And the young man did what he wanted to do. He chose other gods over Jesus. And he walked away sad. Now, we could debate which one of those types of souls, which one were Christians and which ones were not. It's kind of obvious that the first one is not. The other ones, maybe they are, maybe they aren't. But are we the soil, the good soil that produces fruit? That's the one that really matters. And if it takes selling all of our possessions to follow Him, then that's what it takes. And that's what He commands. That's not me talking. That's Jesus talking. Then we saw an example of a young man named Barnabas, or at least that was his nickname, in Acts 4, 36 and 37. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Wow, he did just what Jesus told the young, educated, wise ruler to do, didn't he? He sold what he had what was holding him back. He gave it to the church. He didn't do anything that was any different than other believers did. But guess what? God knows your heart again. God knew Barnabas' heart. And as we saw, God used Barnabas to produce much, much fruits as a result. Why? Because he got rid of all the thorns in his life. There were no more thorns that would choke him out. He was totally committed to serving Jesus Christ, to be an example, to training up others to be a disciple, to take the gospel message to Judea and Samaria and to the other ends of the earth. He was willing. He was able because he was empowered by the Spirit. And he got rid of the thorns in his life so he could produce much fruit. 
Matthew 7, 20 through 23 says this, Thus by their fruits you will recognize them. Not everyone says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, we, did we not prophesy in your name? In your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. There comes a judgment day, period, where you can read in God's Word that we'll be accountable for every idle word we say. He's definitely going to look at the fruits we have in our life. He knows our heart. The young rich man that said, what can I do to inherit eternal life? Who kept the Word, who was a great church goer doing mighty things, will be one of those that he turns away because his heart was not right. The other types of souls, I'm not going to debate which ones you'll turn away or not turn away, but which one do you want to be? Do you want to have a life of meaning and worth? Or do you want to have a life that has been choked out by the things of this world? Or do you want to have a life that has no root? So when you do face crisis and turmoils, you deny Christ. Or do you want to be one that produces much fruit? Do you want to be like Barnabas? Do you want to give your life back to God? Because He owns it in the first place. Without the breath of life that He gave you, you wouldn't exist in the first place. He could take your life at any moment, but He wants you to give it willingly. And that doesn't mean that you're going to suffer. You may suffer for Him, but you'll receive blessings far beyond anything you can ever comprehend. One of the testimonies that one of the guys gave at the um, show was, He said early on when he was starting to follow Jesus and everything that they went out and took in faith that they started this uh, show and they did it in, I think, Greenville or Spartanburg, South Carolina at first. And they did $3 tickets back then and and just gave it up to the Holy Spirit that he would provide for them, that he would empower them. Because you can't rent a uh, Civic Center or Spokane Arena probably for $10 a head. You might can. And you don't know how many people are going to show up. And I think he said they prepared for a 1,000 or something, and they had like 6,000 show up and sell out the place. But he's telling a story before he got that kind of faith. So God does provide. He'll provide everything that you need. That he was going to be worship music at um, this church for a revival. And his wife said, oh, I don't know if we can go or not because you've got to drive all the way over here. They're not going to pay you because they'd already said they're not, they did, couldn't pay you. We have $20 to last all week. Well, fuel wasn't as expensive as it is now, thank goodness. She had enough to get there. She said this money, she gave him the $20, said this money's got to take you all the way there, bring you back. You don't have money to eat. We need the rest of the change that you're going to have left for this week. Go. Now, we can't imagine $20 even doing nothing now for gas. But So he's like, I promise you I will you know, do this. I won't do anything else. I won't even get anything to eat, blah, blah, blah. So he's there at the revival and everything that's going on, and God speaks to him. Oh, we want to see that burning bush and everything. Well, God's like, put the $20 in the offering plate. And he's like, I don't think I heard you correctly. Put the $20 in the offering plate. Well, God, I really can't do that because it's all I have, and you know that. Put the $20 in the offering plate. So he wrestled with it for a while and everything, and... Then it came to him that God does not bless disobedience. So he put the money in the tank, I mean in the offering plate. As he's leaving, as he's getting in his car, this young elderly lady comes out with her pearls of wisdom and says, I've been looking everywhere for you, young man. God told me that I needed to come talk to you after the service. He said that I needed to tell you that he told you something to do and you argued with him. He was like, whoa, (laughs) whoa. And he said, he also told me to tell you to give you this $200 that you needed it worse than I did. So he gave him 10 times what he gave up because he did have a need. That $20 wasn't going to make it for him. And he was willing to serve, so God gave him 10 times. God will bless your life so much for your obedience. But he wants you to do it willingly. He wants you to follow him. Again, related as a father to a child. I can train up my son all day long to do things that are right. And he might obey me. He might go out there and get the wood and bring it in for his mother. 
But when he just goes and does it on his own and you didn't tell him and you get up in the morning and it's all done and there's a fire built, you're like, wow! Same way with God. He wants us to be His obedient children. And He will bless us just as a father wants to give, earthly father wants to give good gifts. So much more does our heavenly father. So I challenge us again to be like Barnabas. Matthew 4, 19 and 20, I've quoted it before, says this. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. And what happened? At once they left their nets and followed him. They left the cares of this world behind. They left their family and friends. They didn't know where their meal was going to come from. They didn't know where a roof was going to be over their head. But they obeyed Jesus when he said, come and follow me. One of the songs that Hillsong United sang had a... um, line in it that said something, and I got this out of it. I don't remember what the line says. You have to give it all away if you're going to go God's way. Now, that doesn't mean that He's going to rob you. It means He's going to bless you so much. But we tend to listen to Satan and say, if I do this, I'm going to have to give up so much. No, if you don't do this, you're giving up way, way too much. So I've got a video, if you guys will get it ready, that's from Hillsong United. They're the ones that closed out the um, show last night. You're welcome to come to the altar. You're welcome to pray in your seat.